What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and today I would like to tell you guys the story of John Law and the Mississippi Bubble. The entire story takes place within the span of about four years in between 1716 and 1720. The story is a cautionary tale for the monetary and fiscal policy that our governments are embarking on right now, as it highlights parts of the architecture or the structure of a currency collapse. Let's dive Dive in. The story of John Law is an extremely important one in light of what central banks, especially the Federal Reserve, are doing today. It's often said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, and that is certainly true with money and economics. Now, keep in mind when this story takes place, because I told you that this takes place between 1716 and 1720 which is 60 years before American independence and the Revolutionary War. And so just keep that in mind when you're thinking about what's going on in this story, that America wasn't even a country at this point. So this is before the Federal Reserve. This is before the other three central banks in America. This is before the Civil War or the new and modern invention of paper money. John Law was born to a Scottish family of bankers and goldsmiths. Now he worked in his family's business and studied banking until he got older. He then moved away to London and became a gambler and lost a lot of money gambling. Later in his professional career, he had made ties with politicians and important and powerful people in France, where he now lived. Now, by 1716, the country of France was, was struggling with poverty, had a lot of national debt because of all the wars that its leadership had put its country through. And so John Law came in with a solution to this problem, and he said, hey, look, let me start a bank, because according to my opinion, the fundamental problem that causes poverty is a lack of of money flowing throughout the system. And he looked around and he said, look, everybody's poor. Nobody has gold and silver, so everybody's poor. And so the problem is the fact that there's not enough money. So let me start a bank. And instead of issuing actual gold and silver coins, I will issue paper notes that are redeemable for gold and silver coins. Now, this wasn't a new idea. There were other countries who had central banks and other countries who had paper bank notes backed by gold and silver throughout the world at that time. And similar things have been tried for thousands of years. So this wasn't actually anything new. But he was granted permission to make this bank. And it was France's first bank that issued currency that was backed up by gold and silver. Now, this is the first item in the structure or the architecture of a monetary collapse. The first thing you want to do is institute a gold exchange standard instead of a real gold standard. Because for the common people at that time, gold and silver were money. They actually traded and used gold and silver coins. So the first step, if you want to destroy a money, an economy, and a financial system is replace the gold and silver with a gold exchange standard or a gold and silver exchange standard. And this gets people used to using your bank notes as money instead of real money as money. Now, the second thing that John Law had in his plan in order to try and help the nation recover out of its poverty was to establish a company that was separate from the bank that was in charge of things like exchange and trade and commerce for the nation. And this ended up being known as the Mississippi Company. They owned a huge portion of land in the area that now makes up the states that are surrounding the Mississippi River. So this was the second part of his plan because he needed to establish a national company that was in charge of trade and commerce and things like that. And then he would use shares of that company to replace the national debt. Now, as you might imagine, this was extremely expensive, large amounts of land, large companies he had to buy and large agreements that he had to secure with different countries in order to nationalize these services. The country clearly didn't have enough money, real money to pay for that. And the country was already so steeply in debt that they wouldn't be able to issue any new debt to afford this. And so they did the classic trick, which is step two of the structure of a monetary collapse, fractional reserve banking. So the bank that he started, instead of just issuing a one for one ratio of if all of the if all of the notes were trying to be redeemed at the same time that they could redeem them, he did this on a fractional reserve basis. And so there was only a small amount of gold and silver in reserve in order to redeem these notes. And then he also started using land from the Mississippi company to back up these bank notes as well. And so it reinforced the idea in the population that, hey, 
these notes are as good as money at any time I could redeem them for a claim of ownership of this company, which is a claim of ownership in land in the Americas, or I could redeem it for gold and silver. And so it reinforces the idea that, hey, this paper is as good as money. Even though if all of that paper was to be redeemed at the same time, there wasn't enough physical stuff to back it up. Now, within the span of two years, we're now at 1718. In the year 1718, he was able to get the country to nationalize the bank. And so now it was a true central bank. And he was pretty much single-handedly in charge of the financial markets and of major commerce and trade for the entire country through the bank and through the Mississippi company. Now, allegedly the plan was as the company, the Mississippi company grows, it'll eventually start producing a lot of profits that will make our country rich and we can use that to pay off our debts. And so allegedly it was a short term speculative gamble if you wanna call it that from hindsight. But in the moment when anything like that is ever happening, there are always going to be issues popping up here and there. And so more expenses were cropping up and as the nation and the bank and the company took control of commerce and trade, Trade. There were always more things that needed to be dealt with and speculators who were trying to get out before the bubble inevitably collapsed that they would have to then support that selling pressure. And so he was constantly needing to issue more and more shares of his Mississippi company. And in order to make sure that the price of the Mississippi company shares did not plummet as a result of issuing new shares, he had to support the price, support the selling pressure by printing new money from the bank. Now, by this time, the shares of the Mississippi company had basically been substituted for the national debt. And so this is very similar to what is happening right now, where our national debt is being completely supported by the printing of money. They're two separate but tight institutions, the federal government and the Federal Reserve. New debt is being issued. And in order to not crater the value of the existing debt, the Federal Reserve is printing new money to buy up all of the sellers to make sure that there exists a floor underneath that selling. So now what you have is a company with a virtually guaranteed bottom. There's guaranteed by the government that you can't lose money on this. And so a massive wave of speculative money ran into this and started massively inflating the value of these shares. And it was to such an extent that that's actually where the word millionaire came from. That term was coined during the Mississippi bubble when newly created millionaires were popping up out of nowhere from people who had bought in to the speculative venture, the Mississippi company. Well, once this inevitably started to reverse and people started to sell, they were wanting to exchange their money for actual gold or silver. And clearly there was so much fake money that had been introduced into the system that there was there's nowhere near enough real wealth in order to back up the money that represented it. And so there was immediately a restriction placed on the redemption of the currency for gold and silver. And pretty quickly after that, it was just outright banned. And so you could not exchange those banknotes, that currency for gold or silver anymore. And that brings us to the next point, that next layer in the structure of a monetary collapse. When the financial bubble starts to implode, you must withdraw the ability to exchange the paper, the fake asset for anything of real value. Now, as soon as you eliminate the ability for people to redeem in something of real value, you immediately run the risk of people just stopping using that currency and immediate currency collapse. And so what you have to do and what John Law did is made that currency legal tender for things like taxes and debts. And so by law, that paper was now money. Now at this point, it's 1720, so just four years after it all began, what historians call speculators had started to realize there is no way this can end well. And so they just started selling everything and using whatever currency they could to purchase gold and silver and purchase real assets like land. As that introduced downward selling pressure on the Mississippi company, they were forced to print more and more and more money to support the price per share of the Mississippi company until there had been so much money, so much fake money pumped into the system that hyperinflation set in. And during some months, it was as much as 30% price inflation every single month. Now at this point, you're in a death trap. Because if you stop the printing to support the prices of the financial assets that back up the entire system, then the value of 
that asset just completely implodes and the system falls apart. But if you continue to print money in order to back up the price of the financial asset that backs up the entire system, then you get yourself into a hyperinflationary collapse. And that's exactly what happened. Within nine months from the start of the inflationary spiral, you came to the end where there was no longer any exchange rate for that currency into gold or silver, which meant that essentially that paper was now worthless. Nobody who had gold or silver to sell would ever sell you any of it in exchange for any amount of that paper currency. And once that happens, now the financial asset, the Mississippi company that was given its value by the money no longer has any value either. Needless to say, the poverty and the economic hardship that this imposed on the average French citizen was so severe that John Law uh, fled from France, left all of his possessions, and actually died just nine years later. Now, this story is important because this took place almost exactly 300 years ago. While the details and the time frame of this from start to finish are different, the structure and the architecture of this monetary collapse is virtually identical. The first thing that happens is that you replace actual gold and silver as money with a paper that is redeemable for that gold and silver. This is known as a gold exchange stamp Standard, which took place in America under FDR. The next step in the structure is to utilize that power to print more currency than there is actual money to back it up and use that additional spending power to secure economic power. This took place until 1971 in America. As soon as that phase reaches the peak and you start to see signs of a run on the bank starting to happen where everybody starts to go exchange their currency for the gold or silver that supposedly backs it up, the next phase is to cut off the exchangeability implement a full fiat currency and say by law that paper is now money instead of what we used to say with backing it up. Now all taxes and debts are illegally payable in this paper. Now to maintain the economic power that you've built up during the previous phase, you're going to need to continue to print new money in order to buy up all of the financial assets that are being sold off by the free market so as to ensure that they don't lose their value. You provide a floor underneath the selling. And we've seen that most recently over the past couple of years. Central banks all around the world have been selling the financial asset, U.S. Treasuries, which is the U.S. national debt, which just like in the John Law story, it was the French national debt that was replaced by the Mississippi company shares. The selling of that financial asset that holds the system together you can't let that fall too hard and too fast. And so you print money to support that selling pressure to put a floor underneath it. And in the final stages, you're in between a rock and a hard place where you have to decide between letting the financial asset and the financial markets just implode or see if you can keep the game going by printing more and more money into a hyper inflationary stage in order to support the asset prices while you sacrifice the value of the actual currency. And we've seen without a doubt, 110% certainty that every central bank around the entire world is more than committed to sacrifice the financial asset values and the actual wealth of the world on the altar of maintaining the facade and printing their currencies into oblivion. Now, I don't care if you look back at that John Law story and you say that the people who got out were speculators, and I don't care if you even say they contributed to the problem, and I don't care if you even say that they caused the problem. You'd be wrong, but you can say that. The fact of the matter is they were the smart ones and they saw the writing on the wall and they knew that this kind of thing had been tried throughout history. It wasn't anything new to France. It wasn't anything, any theory new to John Law. There's nothing new under the sun. In fact, I bet most people don't even know that 300 years ago, a fiat paper currency was tried and failed miserably. Most people think that paper money is simply a modern and new development, a new innovation in monetary history that started relatively recently in the 30s and the 40s. After the collapse in France, people went back to using gold and silver as money. That's what's happened every single time in history for thousands of years. Every time there is a fiat monetary system put into place in order to try and rescue a system from financial collapse, it always ends the same way. An inflationary spiral leading to collapse and the people resort to what has always been money for thousands of years, gold and silver. You might be called a speculator, but if you see the writing on the wall, you've still got time to get out and exchange that worthless paper for something that will still have value after the system collapses. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Let me know if you have any questions or thoughts in the comments section below. You guys have a great day.